Spatial Computing, Part 1, A New Paradigm. This series, Spatial Computing, proposes a new way of interacting with our home computers. Instead of using a mouse, keyboard, and monitor setup, in this new version of personal computing, you'll be able to control digital 3D objects in real space, in real time, with just the use of your hands. This series is a collection of design sketches. If you'd like to see real versions of the technologies driving this design, I'd encourage you to do a YouTube search on the terms augmented reality or cyber gloves. But because I don't have access to these technologies, I'm just using camera tricks and a lot of post-production editing to sketch out what spatial computing might eventually look like. This video, the first in the series, is an overview of the main design concepts driving spatial computing. First, I'll go over how computers can stop thinking in 2D and start thinking in 3D terms. Then, I'll explain how we, the users, will be able to see and interact with these virtual 3D objects. But, before I get into any of that, let's start from the very beginning. Let's say you're standing in a room with a computer, and you're thinking about stuff, and the computer's thinking about stuff, and somehow you need to communicate to each other. You need a way to share information. Now, back in the day, the easiest way to communicate with your computer was this thing called the command line interface. This is when you type something into the computer, and it responds. In this interface, the computer acts as a very sophisticated calculator, but not much more than that. But about 50 years ago, this guy named Douglas Engelbart designs this thing called the computer mouse. And he presents this invention at a demo where he also presents the idea of the paper paradigm. The paper paradigm is a new way of thinking about computing. Unlike the command line interface, which displays only inputs and outputs in the form of text, the paper paradigm uses your computer monitor as a metaphorical piece of paper. So instead of helping you calculate equations, your computer now helps you manage a two-dimensional spatial image. And on this virtual piece of paper, you can use the mouse to highlight text, to move it around, and to create spatial relationships, as if you were jotting down notes on an actual piece of paper. And since its invention 50 years ago, the paper paradigm has evolved into the desktop metaphor. But nonetheless, the same fundamental idea still underlies the technology. A human wants to manage an idea or collection of ideas, and uses a mouse to create spatial relationships inside this computer environment to do so. But 50 years is a really long time in the computing world, and a lot has changed since then. And although the paper paradigm is perfect for a lot of applications, it's not doing such a great job at handling 3D technology. So, back to you and this computer, let's say this computer is programmed to think about a frying pan. Now in the paper paradigm, the way the computer shows you this is through a computer monitor. But that's just a picture of a frying pan. And it might be an interactive and possibly very realistic looking picture, but it's still just a picture on a page. And because it's a picture, you don't get a sense of the size. And although it might be technically interactive, it doesn't have utility in the sense that it's physically present. And the problem boils down to this. Although the computer can think in 3D terms, it doesn't know how to express itself in 3D terms. Because on the one hand, you have a real 3D environment that you're actually standing in, and on the other hand, you have this wacko 3D environment that's off somewhere in the computer's memory banks, and it's not linked to real 3D space at all, because the only way you can see it is through this interactive photograph. But if you can teach the computer how to forget about the photograph and how to start thinking in real 3D terms, then we can begin to bridge this gap. So, back to our example, you're standing in this room with a computer that's programmed to think about this frying pan. But now let's say we also load the computer with a model of the room that you're standing in, and the reason that we do this is so that you and the computer can have a common ground to start from. Now, by placing the model of the frying pan inside the model of the room, the computer is essentially placing the model of the frying pan in the actual room that you're standing in. And although you can't yet see this 3D model, and I'll get to that in a second, the important thing is that we got this computer to start thinking about 3D differently. Instead of modeling it in some abstract, unattached 3D environment and then rendering it to a two-dimensional screen, the computer is now thinking in direct 3D terms. So how do we get the computer to express to you the presence of this 3D model? Let's say in addition to modeling the frying pan and the room, the computer is also tracking the location and orientation of your eyes. Now it doesn't matter how the computer tracks your eyes, I'll get to that in another video, but let's just say for now, it knows where your eyes are located and what orientation they have. With this information, the computer will be able to reasonably figure out what you're looking at and what your perspective is. 
And if the computer can communicate this information to your eyes in real time via a set of goggles, you'll be able to freely walk around the room and experience the physical presence of this digital 3D model. Your 3D experience is no longer an interactive photograph on a monitor that just spins around, but an object that exists in true 3D space. But visually experiencing this digital 3D environment isn't quite enough. You're going to need a way to manipulate it also. You're going to need a way to communicate back to your computer, a way to interact with the 3D environment around you. Now the computer mouse, the perfect peripheral for the paper paradigm, doesn't do much for 3D navigation, but it does have a lot of design concepts that serve as a great analogy to explain how 3D navigation and manipulation might work. Now in the paper paradigm, the computer tracks the user's movements by how they move their mouse. As you undoubtedly already know, as the mouse moves forward, backward, left, and right, the cursor moves up, down, left, and right. This movement is tracked by an optical sensor at the bottom of the mouse. And when you want to activate a selection or action, you push down on one of the mouse buttons. Typically, one button is for your index finger and one is for your middle finger. In spatial computing, the main idea isn't much different. The computer needs a way to track your hand movements up, down, left, right, forward, and back. And instead of using an optical sensor, like on the mouse, we can use infrared LED camera motion tracking instead. This is the same technology that's built inside the Nintendo Wii. And, to activate a selection or action, you create a pinching gesture between your thumb and finger. Sensors on the gloves will let the computer know when you're making these gestures and whether you're pinching with your index finger or middle finger. Moving and clicking are the fundamental gestures that are shared between the mouse and the glove. And I'll talk more about how these gestures can be used in spatial computing in other videos in this series. But with this basic gestural vocabulary, you should be able to communicate rather easily to your 3D computer companion. And with the motion tracking goggles setup, your 3D computer companion should be able to reciprocate communication rather clearly by cluing you in on where it thinks things are. And with this two-way communication, we'll be able to interact with our computers in a completely different way. Applications will no longer be pinned down to the paper paradigm, so instead of word processors, Excel spreadsheets, and Photoshop, we'll have applications that are designed for physical 3D interactions. We'll be able to publish our bodies, our physical presence, across cyberspace in ways that are as easy as posting to YouTube or signing into Skype. We'll be able to watch sports in real 3D, whether the stadium be scaled down to fit on our coffee tables or scaled up so that we're standing at center court. Ultimately, we'll be able to unlock all of the 3D computing power that's currently stuck inside our monitors, and we'll be able to use this information in an intuitive and integrated way. Well, that's all the time I have for this video, but over the next few months I'll be publishing some more videos, each going into detail on specific design concepts or ideas. If you have any questions, please do send them my way and I'll try to answer them either directly or in future videos I make. Otherwise, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.